Hello, I'm Ken Kramer and I'm the interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County and today I'm interviewing William Victor. Um, this is December 4th, 2006 at the Madera Branch Library. Our camera operator today is Robert, uh, Robin, excuse me, Warner. <laughs> um, Bill, thank you very much for agreeing to come and to uh, tell your story and uh, we're, we're, we're pleased that you're willing to do this, so that this will be preserved for from forever now for the future. So maybe you could start by um, just talking a little bit about uh, what you were doing before you entered military and how you came about, whether you were drafted or, okay. or what. Um, I was raised in Illinois. And when I graduated from high school in 1942, uh, the war obviously had started December 7th of 41, our involvement in the war. The uh, senior class was needed quickly for uh, war work and the military, so they sped up our senior year starting on December 7th. We went to class six days a week and graduated early the 1st of May rather than in June. That released all of us for military work or war work. Uh, my plan had been to go to the University of Cincinnati to engineering college because of the co-op program. And I <clears throat> worked that summer on a farm to uh, help the farm crops and asked my draft board if I could go to college in the fall. They said, yeah, we don't need you yet we will one of these days, so go ahead. So I signed up and uh, came to the University of Cincinnati in September of 1942. Um, got in one semester, went home for Christmas and asked the draft board again, should I send in my uh, check for the second semester? And they said, I wouldn't if I were you. <laughs> we're gonna need you before then, so I enlisted in uh, Went in January the 7th of 1943. I uh, went in the U.S. Army and was sent to Camp Grant, Illinois for classification. Uh, about uh, just a few days later, I was sent to Camp Joseph T. Robinson, Arkansas, just outside Little Rock for basic training. Uh, I went through the usual basic training or boot camp, as the Navy guys would say. Uh, a high point of that probably was the uh, inspection by then President Roosevelt who came on Easter Sunday uh, by train and the reason I remember it so well is that the train, the train came from Memphis across the Mississippi River to Camp Robinson and uh, we had assigned, they had assigned a soldier to stand every 50 yards on that track from Memphis to Little Rock to make sure no saboteurs would blow up the President's train. But uh, I was in the ranks when he rode up and down the ranks and reviewed the troops in a, from a jeep. So it was an opportunity to see our president at that time, which is rare because there was no television. Uh, very few people got to see the president. Finished basic training. There was a, uh, I applied for officer candidate school. My eyes were not good enough at that time, so I was rejected for that. The, uh, they made me a, a uh, corporal to keep me there to train other soldiers. But about that time, a uh, Army specialized training program was established to make engineers out of us. I signed up for that, was accepted, and was sent to the University of Oklahoma for nine months of basic engineering. I got uh, two years of electrical engineering in nine months. At the end of that time, we were supposed to graduate and then go to advanced engineering training. Uh, they broke up the program at that time. This was in the spring of 1944 because it became very evident that with the uh, upcoming invasion of Europe, they were gonna need infantry men a lot more than they needed engineers. So they broke up the entire program and every, as far as I know, almost every person that was in that program was assigned to an infantry division someplace in the United States for training. I was sent to Camp House, Texas, which is northern, near Gainesville, Texas, that no longer exists. It 
temporary temporary camp. Um, we got advanced infantry training for very intense training from March until August of that year. Um, fired all the weapons, learned all the tactics, the infantry tactics, did all the forced marching, and uh, got on the trains in, uh, I think as I, as I recall, late August of 1944. Meanwhile, I guess the high point of that adventure was the uh, broadcast of D-Day. When D-Day occurred on June the 6th, 1944, uh, we were all in, involved in training but I had happened to be on guard duty at the stockade in Camp House, Texas. Since there was nothing for the guards to do because there was practically nobody in the stockade, mm -hmm. and we were busy trimming the grass, clearing the grass on D-Day. I was listening to uh, Eisenhower talk about the invasion uh, over the radio while I was cutting grass with a bayonet on the, around the stockade at Camp House, <laughs> Texas. Uh, when my grandchildren ask, what did you do in the war, Grandpa? I can tell them I was no hero. I was <laughs> busy cutting grass. Uh, we shipped over then, and uh, we they went by train from there to uh, Camp Shanks, New York, up the Hudson River, to prepare for, to wait for a ship to go overseas. Uh, the, while we were there, they gave each person there a 12-hour pass in New York City. And uh, myself and three or four of my buddies had never been to New York, of course, all country boys. One from Iowa, I remember Ban Bancroft was from Guthrie Center, Iowa. Uh, we went in to see the sights of, of uh, New York City, so we, they gave us passes. Uh, the USO was wonderful. They, they gave us passes and we got on buses and saw the Empire State Building and the Statue of Liberty. And, uh, the high point of that day, we uh, got hungry about noon. This was on a Sunday got hungry about noon and nobody knew anything about eating in New York. We'd all heard of the Waldorf Astoria restaurant. We thought that'd be a good place to go. We had about seven dollars among us. <laughs> but we uh, went in and ordered, very bravely ordered a meal. We said to ourselves, what's the worst thing they could do to us? <laughs> Send us overseas, we're going anyway. So, so the, uh, we had a very nice meal and the I'm sure the waiter knew what was going on. It came time and we finished our meal and we said, well, how can we postpone this a little longer so we ordered dessert? <laughs> and by then he, the, the maitre d' had come over two or three times. One time he came over and said, see the gentleman standing or sitting at the window over there, that's J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI. He eats here every time he's in New York. And another time he came over and the, he said, that gentleman sitting over at that window is uh, Engine Charlie Wilson, who was the head of General Motors at that time. <clears throat> and uh, he was pointing out the various celebrities that happened to be there. And we thought, boy, this is even going to be more embarrassing <laughs> about the, just finishing our dessert. And the Mater D came over and said, see that gentleman sitting at the window over there? Yes. Uh, he has a son overseas. And he'd like to buy your lunch if it's all right with you, uh, because he knows that you're on your way. And so we said, well, thank you, that'd be great. And we <laughs> got our check and went over and thanked this gentleman. And it turned out that he uh, he knew what was going on, too. He figured it out. So. <laughs> Anyhow, we got out of there with our skins. Um, a day or so later, we uh, came by train down to the dock. Uh, right off the train up the gangplank on the, uh, we went overseas and uh, 7,000 of us went on one ship, the USS Monticello, which was a, a uh, captured Italian luxury liner that had been uh, secured when the war started, converted into a troop ship, and we had the usual bunks of about uh, two feet from, um, about five of us stacked in the, Gallery, galley, and uh, went overseas in convoy because the uh, German U boats were still very active. And in fact, one of our escort ships was sunk in our convoy on the way over. And we went, instead of going to. Did England, you see it get hit? No, well, we saw it burning after, okay. after it was hit. Mm -hmm. uh, we, our convoy, instead of going to England, we went to uh, directly through Gibraltar 
at this time, this was in um, late August, early September of 1944, the Germans had, when the invasion of southern France occurred, the Germans had pulled back about uh, 20 miles north of Marseille. So we landed at Marseille. Marseille was bombed out. Um, warehouses were, some of the warehouses were still intact. But we pulled in, got off our ships, uh, took our barracks bags and hiked up the, the edge of town and set up a perimeter defense around Marseille. <clears throat> then uh, one of the attributes of our 103rd Infantry Division was the, it had gone overseas as supposedly as the best equipped division that we'd ever sent over. Many of our divisions didn't get their full equipment until after they got in combat. We took ours with us. And on the ship, the uh, jeeps and trucks and uh, artillery pieces had all been crated. So they set up an assembly line, and for two weeks, we assembled our vehicles and set up like a Detroit assembly line. And uh, I was working on the jeep line, 12 hours on, 12 hours off was the plan for two weeks. We uh, assembled our jeeps, got them ready to operate, and then all the other equipment as well. Uh, after two weeks, we headed north on the old 40 and 8 trains that they talked about from World War I. Uh, we took uh, trains up the Rhone River. Why did they call them that? Well, they called them because they, in World War I, they carried either 40 men or 8 horses. It was uh, 40 homes and the eight Chevaux was the <laughs> set on the side of the box car. And uh, so we had some straw on the floor and we, we spent about 24 hours on that car to go about 25 miles up the <laughs> Rome River Valley. <clears throat> and we got off at a uh, little town there, I can't remember, Bayo, I think it was. Uh, but the thing I remember about that spot is that we'd still been carrying our two duffel bags with us, everything we had from from Camp House, Texas, all the way. And at that point, they said, you've got to strip down for combat, so put the things you don't want to carry with you in a duffel bag and leave it here. And then your other surplus, we'll put in piles, so they piled your extra uh, socks and underwear and things you weren't going to carry. So you wound up carrying just what you were going to live with on your back your weapon plus <clears throat> dry underwear and dry socks. Uh, we headed out and from that spot and our first combat was uh, or the first engagement we had <clears throat> was a, a, a night movement and we, and I always recall this because we, it was absolutely pitch black and you, in the infantry you and you're walking you, you walk try to keep at least 10 yards between men because a, a mortar shell or an artillery piece could wipe out a whole platoon. But it was so black that we could hardly, couldn't get that far. You almost touched, you had to touch the guy in front of you to know where he was. So we were moving along and, as, and suddenly the line stopped and we, we could, and everybody was quiet because we didn't know where we were. And all you could hear as you got closer and closer to whatever it was, were these gasps. And it was a type of a gasp. And we couldn't figure what was happening until we got up there and it was our turn. We were fording um, the river. Oh, this was November 11th, <laughs> snow about that deep on the ground. We forded a river and it was up to about here on me. And I had some friends that were only about that tall and we kind of boosted up to get across this river. But we were absolutely soaked, obviously. We took this very, uh, it wasn't over uh, uh, 25 yards, probably 50 yards across, but it got that deep as you went across. <clears throat> so you learned what the gasps were about. The gasps were when those bodies hit the water. <laughs> it, and then it, it, it involuntary. I mean, uh, <clears throat> that was the beginning of a cold, a long cold winter. Uh, we never, I never, never really got warm after that all winter long. The, uh, this was the Vosges Mountains. Uh, the, this was near the Saint Mountains again. The Vosges Mountains. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, those mountains had not been conquered since Hannibal did it back in the days he had the elephants. Uh, but that's where our, our attack was. We were the Seventh Army. We couldn't light a fire because that would give our location away, so we stayed huddled together under near trees until dawn. And you were wet. You were soaking wet uh, all the way through. Everything couldn't change. Uh, the only thing you dry or anything you were holding over your head. And uh, anyhow, we, dawn came. We started moving across and up a, a ridge. And that was when I saw my first dead soldier, German soldier, in the snow there. And he looked so uh, lifelike that I thought that this was a training exercise, that they, they had put a dummy there just to give us an idea of what the soldiers would look like. But then we saw many more as we went on up the, uh, this trail. So we got to the town of St. D.A., that's S-T-D-I-E, and uh, the Germans were still there. And that was our first real firefight. And they pulled out that evening. This was about uh, uh, 14th, 15th of, December, of November. They pulled out that night and they set the town on fire. And before they pulled out, so we spent the night uh, illuminated by this fire. We were on a hillside surrounding it. And we dug in, the Germans kept shelling us in our foxholes in this uh, hillside, but that was our first in introduction to combat was that, that night at San Diego. <clears throat> we, How were you, were you scared? Oh yeah, Every, everybody was and I, everybody reacts differently, but I think the, uh, the scaredness was uh, never being sure that you could react properly to, if your buddy needed you, you were always afraid you'd let your buddy down. You yeah. weren't scared so much for yourself, I don't think, I, I don't remember feeling that. I, I didn't expect to come back home alive when I went. I, uh, the infantry mortality rate was so great that uh, uh, I just gave, gave, gave that no thought. Uh, but it, if we got back, fine. If we didn't, well, that was the way it was going to be. <clears throat> but, the, but the overriding concern was how were you able to help your yeah. your buddy if they don't, needed don't you? Don't let your buddies down because it was a team. Every This whole thing is a team operation. And mine particularly, I was a gunner on this 60 millimeter mortar, and uh, we had a four-man, five-man squad, three had a gunner, assistant gunner, and squad leader, and uh, two ammunition carriers. And they carried the uh, <coughs> rounds about that long, and 60 millimeters in diameter. Uh, I guess I need to explain what a mortar is for people who don't know. A mortar is a tube mounted on a base plate and you fire it by dropping the shell down and it has like a, a shotgun shell on the, in, on the inside of it. It hits the firing pin when it hits the bottom and it shoots it out. And it uh, goes, depending on the elevation and the number of charges you put on it, it goes anywhere from 100 yards to 1,000 yards. So it's like being able to throw a hand grenade that far. It's about that about that damaging. And it explodes when it hits. Explodes when it hits. If it's an uh, explosive shell, we also had uh, white phosphorus shells so we could eliminate the, eliminate the night when we heard patrols out front and so on. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, we moved with a, as the point of the infantry then uh, moved from down the roads. And we uh, moved until we got fired upon. We got fired upon, we uh, deployed and and counteracted until we conquered whatever was firing at us and uh, then we moved on. And the worst part was in towns, of course, going through towns. Uh, and it was an interesting uh, thing that happened is that uh, as we went through the French towns in the Vosges Mountains, we were greeted as liberators. And then as we got further and further, we got to Alsace. And they were German-speaking, but French. They had been part of France since World War I. And, but they still had a great deal of sympathy for the German. And uh, when we uh, went, moved in Alsace, we went to France, the uh, people there would tell us where the snipers were. 
of the German snipers and the church steeple or up on the hillside or wherever. When we got to Alsace, they dummied up. They wouldn't tell us, so we uh, quite often had to blow up some church steeples. We wouldn't have to otherwise if they would let us know about it. But we, uh, as we moved town from town to town, we had uh, different kinds of battles. We went to, got across the border into Germany in the uh, early December. Uh, we were the first troops of the 7th Army to get into Germany and hit the Siegfried Line, which the Germans defended there. And it was uh, well-built uh, pillboxes. We got uh, the first one we hit. We did, didn't know what we were getting into. It was camouflage as a little cottage. And uh, after we blew the sides off the cottage, we realized it was a concrete pillbox. Mm. And the Germans had counter fire so that they could uh, uh, keep us, they kept us at bay. We uh, stayed there for three days and nights trying to break through, get around it, and there was no way we could. We brought heavy artillery up, fire directly at us. Uh, nothing got us through. But just at that moment was when the Battle of the Bulge started, about uh, 20 miles north of us, 25 miles. And so they uh, decided to pull us back. And on Christmas Eve, or the 23rd of December, uh, they trucked us up to the south edge of the Bulge. And we beat uh, against the Third Army, which was being condensed to contain the boat, and they put us in a defensive position, which we soon, soon called the fur-lined foxholes, because we were there for two weeks in the same spot, and we, our company of 200 men, 180 men, defended about a two-mile front in the woods. We had a, we were right on the edge of the woods. There was an open space about a thousand yards wide between us and the woods over there, and the Germans that were not involved in the bulge were over on the other side. And every night we could hear them when their, their kitchen trucks would come up and rattling their mess kits. And, and uh, Christmas Eve we were singing Silent Night and other songs and you could hear them singing over on the other side. It's that, that kind of a peaceful moment. And that lasted until the bulge was contained. And then the what lasted the peaceful moments? Or yeah, those moments because we were in, they didn't have enough people to attack and we didn't either, so we were just standoff there for about two weeks. Um, then, when the uh, bulge was contained and the call of, was pulled out of after he said nuts to the German surrender <laughs> request, he became our division commander. He he got his second star by becoming the commander of the 103rd Infantry Division, and the uh, one that we had gone overseas with, a, uh, a reserve general, uh, General Hefner, uh, was relieved of duty and went back to Chicago, and General McAuliffe took over, and we uh, saw a lot of difference immediately. He was a real combat man. Before you go into that, I'm, I'm just curious, you're two weeks in the same spot, same foxhole. Yeah. But describe what it life was like the way you you obviously were still cold and I've heard other people well, say it was not very what we, what we, I mentioned fur line foxholes and that's literally what we did we every day we dug dug them deeper and wider and we put log roofs over them they were really dugouts mm -hmm. we went back to the German there was a German barracks about a mile back in the woods went back there and we got little cook stoves and we put these cook stoves in the corner of our dugouts so we had heat in there. You know, <coughs> we had uh, <coughs> we put window panes in the one corner so you get some light in the day daytime. And then we had a piece of steel we'd lay over that at nighttime. We we really lived great. We had a blackout curtain on the entrance. Uh, we went deer hunting back in the woods during the daytime, and, and about uh, <coughs> five times a day we would fire some mortar shells over to. In fact, we the first time we did that was when they were gathered for dinner one night, and immediately they fired back the same number of shells we did. 
so we decided there wasn't anything to do about that. But every night we'd send patrols out <clears throat> over and probe their line, and they were doing the same thing. We'd throw white phosphorus shells and catch them out in the open. And so there were a few casualties, but uh, uh, very few during that period of time. <clears throat> when the boat was contained, our uh, Our mission was to <clears throat> go attack a town called Sessenheim, France, <clears throat> on January the 19th. And our intelligence had told us that it was defended by old men and young boys. <clears throat> the, uh, but the night before we got there, uh, the SS troops moved in because they were starting the second bulge there. It, Hitler called it Nord, Nordwind or North Wind, and it was to recapture Strasbourg <clears throat> by breaking a wedge right through, and we happened to hit it head on. So January 19th of 1945 was the worst day of my life and uh, many others. We uh, attacked across an open field with uh, eight tanks supporting us, and we uh, they held the Germans held their fire until we got almost the edge of town, and they opened up then with uh, direct tank fire and 88s, and they knocked out all eight of our tanks in about 10 minutes. <coughs> um, I was coming up, and we were attacking a flank flanking movement, and our my platoon leader was on the ground, and I saw him get hit. And at just about the moment he got hit, he had told the people ahead of me, get in that bar in the edge of town. And by the time I got up to where I could hear what he was saying, uh, he had seen the company next to us was retreating. So he said, get back to the woods. So I heard the get back to the woods order, and I headed back across and the Germans were picking out everybody they could as they went back across the field, but I got back across and uh, found a, a few other guys back there. And that night, I slept under one of our tanks that was in reserve, and the and there were about uh, 25 to 30 of us were there out of the whole company. The rest of them had been captured or killed, or we didn't know what. <clears throat> it turned out that uh, about uh, 40 of them got captured in that barn. Mm. They, they did get in the barn. My best friend was in there. And uh, they survived the captivity and uh, got through that ordeal all right. <clears throat> but of course, at that time, you, did, you had no idea what no. happened to them. No, and I didn't know uh, he'd been captured until... Uh, almost two months later, his mother wrote me and said they dared word that he was a prisoner of war. <clears throat> and then he, Andy, uh, wrote me a letter on my birthday, April 16th. Uh, I got, it was the day he got uh, rescued or released by the British. And he wrote me a letter the next day, which I got a few days later, that uh, told me about his experience. And, We've been together quite often since then. In fact, we were together two months ago in San Antonio, Texas, where he lives in Austin. <clears throat> but we regrouped after that, and the survivors got reassembled. We got replacements. We went back to the Siegfried Line, the same place we've been before. <laughs> Only this time we had a lot more support, a lot of air support, and, and we broke through that time. And once we got through the Siegfried line, we started moving, and we moved on anything that the infantrymen walked, of course, but the, uh, we had tankers, we had tank destroyers, and uh, we rode on anything that we could ride on. And we piled on the outside, and as we get fired upon, we de deploy, and I remember a, a tank destroyer um, outfit that was attached to us, a battalion. 
and they had the half tracks, which was the back end of the thing has tracks on it, the front has wheels, and they towed a 75 millimeter uh, artillery piece behind them so that when they got fired upon, they had to get out of the half track, they had to grab the uh, artillery piece, move it around, spread the, the spades on it, and set it to fire. And this uh, sergeant that was in charge of the squad that was I was riding on with him, <clears throat> uh, one day I remember we came in the edge of town and we got fired on, and as soon as we got fired on, we knew it was coming from a castle right on the uh, edge of this town, a very prominent building. And uh, somebody said it's the window on the left, second second floor, the window on the left, and about. Within 10 seconds, he put a round through that window. Oh my goodness. With a 75 millimeter gun, and the resistance went down very quick. And he gave me a big, uh, big uh, hug and said, Sergeant Davis and Sergeant Victor, unbeatable combination. <laughs> anyhow, we, we got we good pals uh, helping each other out. Anyhow, we rode with them uh, until we got to, uh, I had a picture that I gave. Uh, the library of the uh, taken a bit involved Austria. We went through Oberammergau, uh, Garmisch Partenkirchen, the place where the 1936 Winter Olympics had been. Uh, we uh, captured those towns, went on to Innsbruck, Austria, and we were greeted as really as liberators in Innsbruck because they realized the war was about over. And these were Austrians, and they, of course, had been subjugated by Hitler and the Anschluss in 38, 39. So many of them were happy to be relieved. Uh, but we uh, went through Innsbruck. We drove then about 20 miles south of Innsbruck is uh, Brenner Pass. And we uh, went through Brenner Pass and uh, Mark Clark's Fifth Army was coming up uh, through Italy. And we met them about uh, 10 miles into Italy. And uh, we pulled back and went in occupation in a little resort town there called Trins, T-R-I-N-S, Austria, a little resort hotel. Had a royal family that was living in the top floor, and we took over the rest of the hotel. And we lived there for a month while they were deciding what to do with us. Uh, this was after the VE day and the armistice was signed. Oh, I should mention, just before that, our last real fight was at uh, Landsberg, Germany, just before we went into Austria. And that's where Hitler had been in prison where he wrote Mein Kampf, the uh, book in which he outlined all of his dreams of conquering the world. And the uh, cell where he was has a, has a plaque on it that showed uh, a memory of his being there. But that uh, night before we got there, we coming along the Lech River, which runs through Landsberg. And we, somebody had found that there was a dam that uh, we could walk under the river. Uh, so we got the guard, they killed the guard at the dam, got through the, the dam and came to the other side of the river, the German side, and we're walking down the road in our usual columns toward Landsberg. And there was a, one of the things that you got used to as an infantryman walking down the road was uh, the jeeps. Occasionally the jeeps of the commanding officer or somebody would, that uh, forward reserve would come down and they'd, they'd come right down the middle of the road. You were on both sides walking and you never paying attention to them. So we were walking down this road that black night and a jeep came through the whole ranks. And again, you could hear almost the same kind of a gasp as it went by, because nobody could react quickly enough. It was a German Jeep, Ooh. because we didn't have anything on that side of the road. <clears throat> we had walked through this tunnel, but nobody thought, thought about it. the fact that the Germans were over there, and, the, and this German Jeep with three men on it drove right through our entire company and got through it, not a shot was fired because nobody could react quickly enough to the fact that they were we were on their side of the river. Anyhow, we, by the time we got up to the edge of town, I don't know if these guys had alerted them or somebody had, anyhow, we got ambushed. And they were on the hillside and they pinned us down pretty good for about three hours. 
and we discarded all of our equipment. We were just scrambling to save ourselves. And uh, finally, it stopped about dawn. just a little after dawn. It stopped. Uh, a couple of my good friends got wounded that morning, and that was the last real uh, firefight we were in. Then uh, we went into town. Uh, they, there was a Hungarian regiment defending the town. And uh, once they realized we had them surrounded, they offered their sword and surrender as commander insisted that our company commander command accept his sword and surrender. It was one of the formal moments of the war. But uh, my sergeant and I uh, said we got to go back and pick up all the equipment that we dropped this morning when we got ambushed. So he and I and three other guys went back down the road. And this time we said we'll go across where they ambushed us, where their foxholes were on top of the ridge. We went back that way. As we got back to an open field about, I suppose, uh, three miles out of town, uh, a German soldier came toward us with his hands up, waving, comrade, comrade. And we both beckoned and come toward us, and we spread out to protect each other. And he came over and spoke in very good English. Uh, I have some, uh, I think he said three or four, of my friends want to surrender if you promise not to shoot us. And we said, no, we're taking prisoners and you, you'll be safe. Uh, tell them to come out, take their helmets off, come out with their soft hat on and their hands in their air. And uh, so he went back to the barn and about two minutes later, uh, about three of them came out with their hands on their head and then four more came out and then five more, <laughs> 10. And we finally wound up with 54 Whoa. men came out of that barn. <laughs> We had uh, seven officers, and the officers were equipped with pistols. And we, so we, we, each of us got about two pistols for souvenirs. I have one of, still have one of them at home. A Mauser, uh, I got a Mauser and a P-38, uh, which are the most valued souvenirs you could get in combat. And uh, all the rest of them, of course, were disarmed. So we searched them all, lined them up, and then we marched them back to town and had them pick up our equipment and carry it back in. And we met the, our company coming out, and we moved on from there. But by that time, the, the war was so nearly over, everybody knew it was, that uh, we just sent the prisoners back down the line and hoped somebody would pick them up back <laughs> there. And they, they did. They had the civil, civil government groups that would uh, take these prisoners and put them in this defense tent enclosure, and minimum, minimal guarding because they're, they're, everybody was done fighting. They're, you said um, that when, back when there was a change of commander, that you could really see the difference. And, uh, well, an example, the only time I saw General McCullough up close was uh, we got pinned down uh, by a roadblock. One of the things the Germans did, uh, this was all uh, part of the Hurtgen Forest and the uh, Black Forest area in the Woj Mountains, and all great big pine trees everywhere. And when they retreated, in order to deny us the roads, they would knock these trees down and blast, blast them so they fell across the road in a kind of a checkerboard pattern. And we couldn't, our vehicles couldn't get through, we, we couldn't get through the roads. <clears throat> so the uh, combat engineers would come up and blast those logs and get them out of the way. Well, the, our division combat engineers came up this was about two weeks after McCullough took command, I guess. Um, came up and they were being fired. Of course, the Germans had a crossfire up to protect these roadblocks. And the chief, the colonel in charge of the Corps of Engineers uh, said, we're, let's get out of here, we're getting shot at. And that's about that time General McCullough came up in his chief. And he said, where are you going? And he said, well, we're, we're getting out of here because it's a hot fire, fire point up there. He said, you're combat engineers, aren't you? He said, yes, sir. So that's combat. Go fix that. <laughs> so they came up and under fire. They blasted these things, and we moved on in. But the whole tenor of the division seemed to change when he took charge. You see? Mm -hmm. you, uh, show here the hoop. You got a purple heart, did you? Yes, I got wounded uh, shrapnel in the leg. 
just a slight wound and uh, not enough to be evacuated. In uh, December 14th, near Lundbach, France, mm -hmm. and the uh, tree burst, uh, which was the thing we hated most of all. Uh, one of the things we learned after training in Texas, you know, they always told you to lay flat on the ground and minimize yourself as a target. But we found out that if you did that and the artillery burst in the air, the shrapnel comes down like this, mm -hmm. and you're a bigger target than. So we learned to be tree hookers. And uh, if you stay upright and near the tree, you know, you're the safest place you could be. And uh, this first round came in before we realized what was happening and it uh, sliced across my leg and got the, through my pants and combat boot and enough blood that the uh, medic came up and bandaged me and that gave me a purple heart. Hmm. Wow. Uh, the other Again, uh, there's no no uh, no winners in a war, and there's no very few people who claim to be heroes, and I'm not one of them. Uh, the the combat infantry badge is probably the I figure the greatest thing that I got because that shows that you you stayed and you fought and you per for perseverance as much as anything. <clears throat> And with that came the Bronze Star, but that's, again, just for perseverance as far as I'm <coughs> Now, when the war ended, if you want to finish the story, the war ended, we were put in uh, different organizations, depending on how many points we'd earned. You got points for how many months you'd been in the Army, how, much, how many months overseas, how many... Uh, Purple Arch you had. Um, they had a point system and the <clears throat> people with the most points uh, got shipped home. <coughs> <coughs> men with the most, oh, excuse me, men, men with the most points uh, got shipped home very quickly after VE Day <clears throat> with the idea that they would get a leave at home and then be redeployed to fight in the Pacific. The men who had a kind of a medium group of points were to be shipped home later, like in uh, August or September, get their leave and then be ready for the invasion of Japan. The ones that were below that level, and that's where almost my whole group fell, uh, were to be retrained in Europe and then go directly to Japan to be part of that invasion force. And they figured they needed a million man invasion force in Japan. And we were going to be part of that. So all summer long, and uh, I was transferred because of my mortar experience. <coughs> I was transferred to a 4.2 millimeter, 4.2 inch. Let me stop. The uh, training that we went through in that summer <clears throat> was uh, getting ready for the invasion of Japan. The, because of my mortar experience, they transferred me to a 4.2 inch mortar, bigger mm -hmm. mortar, which fired bigger shells and further. We did indoctrination along a mountainside near Salzburg. We were housed in a slave labor um, cement factory that Hitler or the German army had. <clears throat> we cleaned it all up and used DDT, which you can't use anymore, to fumigate the whole place. Well, yeah, we spent um, over a month or two months there, and we went out every day and we fired these mortars to get used to them. They were whole, whole different weapons, almost like an artillery piece. And the first experience we had, I was a squad leader for this squad, and the first experience we had was trying to figure out how much explosive to put on them to fire them. And we used white, white phosphorus shells so we could see the burst when they landed and no shrapnel would be flying around. So we fired our first round and we waited and waited and waited and didn't see anything, so we figured it must be a dud. So we fired another one waited and didn't see anything. 
So somebody said that it must be falling in that valley between us and the mountain that we're shooting at, because it's really further away than we think it is. It's probably in that valley. So let's put some more increments on there and blow it further. <laughs> so we put a maximum number on there. Still didn't see anything. About that time, a jeep came roaring around the road, and it was a commanding officer. <laughs> We had been shooting over the mountain and scaring the daylights out of the people in the little village on the other side of the mountain. Because we, we didn't know how far this thing went. Then we realized that we put way too much on there. So we soon learned how to calibrate it and we got back so we could we could put a line right across the tree line on this mountain of white phosphor shells. We got pretty good after a month or so of practice. And then we uh, I guess we were, yeah, we were still there when uh, the e BJ Day came, when the atom bomb was dropped in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that was just a glorious day for all of us. Uh, we were just so glad, that, and I still am, that uh, Truman had the nerve to use that as it had to be used. It probably saved more Japanese lives than it did American lives because the Japanese were dedicated to defend their homeland to the death. Of, I'm sure they would of, have. Of, of, of citizens besides, besides military. They, they were arming oh, yeah. women and children. Oh, yeah. the, the destruction would have been just total if, uh, if they had not uh, convinced them that we, we had a weapon they better not uh, resist. Anyhow, we had a great celebration because we knew then that our war was over. We would not have to go. Then it became a matter of when are we going to get home? <laughs> and this was, in, of course, in uh, September of 45. So uh, they started deploying as fast as they get ships. They started deploying people. And uh, we got moved from one group to another by points until finally in uh, Christmas, I was at Karlsruhe, Germany at Christmas time on my way to La Havre. Well, Harb was the point of demarcation. Um, we went to the, they had lucky, uh, Camp Lucky Strike. The camps of Lahar all had cigarette names. It uh, would mm -hmm. uh, be politically incorrect these days, but uh, I was in Camp Lucky Strike where we changed our invasion currency into the greenbacks for the first time we saw real American money again. We uh, got all of our shots and got ready to go home. We uh, marched down to the dock, got on a Victory uh, Liberty, Liberty ship, which carried about 500 troops on it. We sailed out, and that uh, out in the English Channel, blew a boiler, and had to went over to England to see about repairs. They couldn't repair it, so we went back across the English Channel with about three knots. Everybody, everybody <laughs> sick. Came back 24 hours later, we're back the same dock we left, this in January of 1946. We walked across, down the gangplank, across and up to another gangplank to another ship and came across and took us uh, 12 days to make it north of Atlantic in January. Uh, some days, uh, the first day out, I think we made about 200 miles. And the second day, we made about 60 miles. It was so, uh, Waves were so big, we just, us land lovers thought they'd never float. <laughs> but we got home, I got to Camp Dix, uh, New Jersey, and then back to, to uh, yeah, Camp Grant, Illinois, and got my discharge in January 28th of 1946, just over three years later. Wow. <clears throat> what an experience. Uh, do you feel that um, you know you saw so much killing and battle? Did you do you feel that you um, came away with any lasting injury or um, post-traumatic psychological? Yeah, psychological stress. Or I think hearing, uh, hearing. I think all of us had some of that for a while, and I identify with the guys from Vietnam and the other places, the Korea that have had. Uh, was it post post traumatic, post -traumatic yeah. stress syndrome? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but no, I, I had bad dreams for uh, maybe six months or so. But that was happening even while I was still in Europe. Uh, once the combat was over, you still um, had that, those feelings, but I, uh, I think I adapted pretty quickly back to my civilian mode and uh, put all that aside. Did you suffer any hearing damage from all being around these big guns? I don't know whether I did or not. I, uh, I didn't have, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it. Did they give you hearing protection back then? No, 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 we didn't. They just put some cotton in our ears when we had, when we had some, but uh, no, the, uh, no, I did not. No, no other physical damage. My wound was so slight it was it, it, a bandage took care of that, and so I, I don't, I see so many guys who were wounded so much worse. Yeah, and, uh, I feel very fortunate. Well, that's an incredible story, and uh, I certainly want to thank you for thank being you. willing to come and tell the story, and <coughs> especially thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Uh, really My pleasure. Glad to, glad to share it.